Welcome everyone to this session at the World Water Week, fully virtual. Thank you for your interest um, and for taking time to join this panel of experts that we have invited um, for you. Welcome also to all those of you who will see the recording of the session because they are in different time zones and still sleeping now. Um, they can enjoy some um, nice breakfast entertainment, um, particularly in the US and um, the Americas. My name is Habib Benzian. I'm a research professor at Newark University, and I'm also director of a WHO collaborating center. Having been involved for the last 15 years in, in washing schools and school health, I've also worked a lot with German agencies. As you see on the conveners list, um, the main convener is GIZ, the German Development Corporation. Co-conveners are WHO, the unit, the Water Sanitation and Health Unit and the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. The topic of the session is to explore the intersection of washing schools and the One Health concept. We will hear from experts coming from various disciplines and backgrounds who will help us to understand the potential of bringing these concepts and approaches together. Um, of course, like all of you, I was scanning through the hundreds of sessions at this World Water Week, um, quite an impressive assembly, but I could not find any other session um, related to One Health. So it seems that somehow we are breaking ground together today by bringing this topic to this conference. Before I get started um, with introducing the experts and the panelists that um, are here on board, um, allow me some brief housekeeping remarks. Um, as you see, this is a webinar format. That means for you as a participant, all microphones are disabled. You are encouraged um, to use the comment, uh, the, the chat function on the, the Pathable website. So the, the World Water Week main website, not the Zoom um, uh, 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 chat function. We have two colleagues, Alexander Winschka and, and Nicole Stauff, who will um, monitor the chat and who will um, try to address some of the questions or pass them on to the panelists as we go along in the session. You see the live transcript button on the lower right menu of your screen. Um, if you prefer to see closed captions, um, please enable this on your own screen. A recording will be available very soon after the meeting um, and you can then rewind and rewatch or share um, this recording. We have a very strict time limit. Um, the session will be closed automatically, so we have to be uh, very timely towards the end. So please bear with me um, if we have to cut things short or um, really wind up things towards the end. We will try to uh, keep this session as lively and as entertaining as possible. Um, see it as a, as a friendly um, talk show um, rather than a formal webinar where you will see hundreds of presentations. We will only have one slide um, through the course of the session. The rest is really um, a talk between the experts um, responding to some questions and also taking in the input that you as participants are providing. So let's begin this, this conversation. Um, I will first introduce uh, the panelists one by one, and they will um, share their views on One Health and Washing Schools and where they see themselves in this context um, as a starting introduction to set the scene. Um, the first panelist that I would like to, to call on is uh, Dr. Morgenroth. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> apologies is Dr. Mongold Klein. Um, he's the uh, unit head of the uh, Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. And he is the division head, sorry, division head is your formal um, title, for pandemic prevention, one health, animal health, and biodiversity. Um, Dr. Mongold Klein, please. Yes, good morning, nice to meet you. So feel free to share your, your in, initial thoughts um, on this whole topic of One Health and WASH, um, just a two, three minute uh, sharing of, of ideas. Okay, um, as a ministry, we, we are um, active 
in, in quite a number of different sectors. And I think uh, the special thing about um, One Health as a topic is that it is not a sector. It is something which interlinks different sectors we are working in, um, um, especially the sector of, of, of human health, uh, medicine, of, of animal health, which is of course uh, also linked to the agriculture sector and the sector of environment, uh, environment protection, nature protection, where we um, as a ministry are also one of um, the, the, the bigger donors, the bigger bilateral donors um, in, 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 the, in the, um, developing, um, in the developed world, so to say. So um, with the pandemics, this has of course been much more uh, important. We have started discussions before, and I think um, the pandemic has helped us to, to forge um, a more coherent strategy, which um, would also, um, that is our hope at least, help to prevent future zoonoses, future epidemics and future pandemics. Thank you, Dr. Von Klein. Um, we'll get back to these topics that you, you mentioned um, and some of those points um, will come up again in the discussion. Allow me to introduce our next panelist, um, Kate Medlicott. Um, she's team leader um, for sanitation and wastewater um, at WHO headquarters uh, in Geneva. Um, from the unit uh, Water Sanitation and Health. Oh, hygiene, I forgot. Water Sanitation, Hygiene and Health Unit. Um, please, Kate. Uh, yes, hi, everyone, and thank you for mentioning hygiene. We're certainly working a lot more on that than we, we have in the past. Um, uh, yeah, so to, to One Health, I mean, you know, obviously, there's a clear understanding that this is about the interse intersection between human, animal, and environmental health, and and uh, you know, WHO has been working with One Health as a concept for, for, for quite a long time, I would say, from a rather sort of anthropocentric viewpoint as in how does animal and an ecosystem health impact on, on human health, um, and with a real focus on zoonotic diseases, uh, you know, existing ones or emerging, and food safety. Um, but I think what we've, we've seen at WHO and the, you know, prompted um, partly by COVID, but I think a, a few other drivers is, is a, a real raising in the profile of One Health and some really concerted work to make this happen, certainly at a much higher level than I'm at. Um, and so that's been getting the interagency agreements between WHO, FAO, OIE and UNEP really sort of fit for purpose in terms of addressing One Health and who does what and making sure we have the right expert groups in place to to um, advise on, on how to address WHO's overall portfolio from a One Health perspective. And I think that's really still growing um, and evolving in, in terms of what you know, uh, One Health is going to look like within WHO. But I was just sort of skimming some of the notes uh, in advance of this. And I think what's, what's interesting is they are approaching it from you know, quite a fresh perspective. So really questioning, um, if from WHO's perspective, we should be maintaining this kind of anthropocentric view or whether we should be looking more about, you know, the animal and ecosystem health in its, in its own right. And also a discussion about, um, about sort of broadening the focus from um, zoonoses and, and food safety. So I think it's quite a exciting moment for One Health within, within WHO, but a, an a unfinished discussion at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. This is a fascinating insight into WHO's positioning in this area. And, and you mentioned greatly this uh, aspect of intersectoral work, which we will uh, come back to in the discussion, but also the entry and starting point. Um, from which angle do you look at One Health? Um, June Belisario is our next um, uh, speaker, panelist, Professor June Belisario. He's Dean of the College of Public Health at the University of the Philippines. He's also with the National Institute of Health in Manila in the Philippines. Um, please, June, I forgot to mention that you are one of the foremost experts on uh, intestinal worms worldwide. Pleasure to have you on board. You are still on mute, June. 
Sorry about that. Thanks, Habib, for the kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you in this panel on WASH in Schools and One Health. Um, uh, from the point of view of academe, of course, um, we are tasked you know, to help contribute to knowledge generation. And, and I, I think uh, we've been privileged and fortunate to have had the chance to, to uh, work with so many partners and, and come up with data information shared with the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education here in the Philippines to the WHO. Um, leading to some modest accomplishments. No? And, and in fact, it's not a simple case, Habib, of diagnosing and treating patients, no? as, as is the training in med school. No? In public health, we talk about, um, actually, uh, public health talks about One Health all the time. No? Even before the concept of One Health, public health, innately collaborative in nature, talks about different disciplines working with each other, to actually generate knowledge, you know, to enhance policy and to enhance service delivery, ultimately improving the health of people, especially our children, you know, the, the hope for the future. Um, and, and so we've been privileged to be working with some of you, Bella here, and of course you, Habib, you know, in Washington schools. The beginnings was in the beginnings were were in essential health care, where we tried to marry intestinal worms, intestinal helminth infections, and dental caries among Filipino children. Uh, Bella, of course, being the champion there, and you, Habib, and, and we joining forces, the top two major cons health concerns among school children in the Philippines. No? Uh, abdominal pain caused by intestinal parasites and, and toothache as a result of dental caries that, are, that are, are quite complicated. Bella can talk more about this in a short while. Of course, uh, some modest um, achievements in scoring a little bit with the Ministry of Education in the Philippines. Now it's called WINS. I think there is a need, a, a call for more collaboration, more than ever, especially with the pandemic. You know, the, the, the two panelists previously talked about the pandemic. From the public health side of things, Habib and, and panel, disruption of services. Now we have lagged behind on, on so many fronts, including control prevention. A while ago, we were talking about elimination. You, uh, before the pandemic, I don't think we're going to reach elimination of some of these worm problems. Not meeting the SDGs and therefore platform, One Health platform, One Health approach probably is very relevant at this time. As we try to catch up post-pandemic, Looking forward to collaborating with many of you. Over, Habib. Thank you, June. Again, plenty of topics to continue our discussion with. Um, let me, in the interest of time, move on to our, our last panelist, um, Dr. Bella Monson from the German Development um, Corporation, GIZ. She's a senior advisor on school health, um, and she will share very practical aspects of her work related to washing schools and One Health. Bella, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, Habib, uh, for the friendly introduction. And I think uh, the previous speakers perfectly provide the ground for seeing where does the school sit in all of that. Uh, schools are important places where children, where the entire school age population spend at least half of the day. Schools are the ideal setting for providing a healthy and safe environment for the learners and the teachers, and also to get familiar with routines of healthy lifestyle. And this benefits health and well-being, and of course, also education. Uh, in addition, schools are also the best places to expose parents and the entire community with these important aspects of one health and a healthy environment. Uh, schools are places where the three, as you can see on this slide, where the three domains of One Health, which is human health, the environment, and animal health, or in this case we see pathogens uh, there, naturally interact and where infection prevention and control measures can be implemented in tangible ways. Um, the school directly impacts child health and well-being and of course should prevent the spread of pathogens and other health risks. Uh, we all have seen with the um, pandemic, this has highlighted again the central role of schools and the transmission mode of COVID-19 requires schools to improve particularly their wash conditions. 
to implement hygiene measures. That means access to water, hand washing facilities with soap, to, to, uh, and, and also waste management. And that's important to develop all over the school a culture of cleanliness throughout school life. On the other hand, um, schools can uh, are institutions that really are setting to prevent the One Health concept or really, uh, as I like to say, this uh, public health, the core public, this is public health at the core. And uh, schools have uh, are implementing One Health policies and of course implementing guidelines because that's within their mandate and that requires developing healthy routines as schools are organized around routines. And as the other speakers pointed that out, very important is the interlinkage with other sectors. So even it's around One Health is around the health, but of course it's happening within the school environment. So it's interacting and specifically the education sector is in the lead to implement healthy policies because at the end of the day, health is reached, most health is reached outside the health sector. I think I stop here and we will have other things to talk about. Thanks. Thank you, Bella, for this, this overview. I think you are, from all, of all panelists, the, the one who is closest to the school reality and who has the deepest insights into the functioning of, of the education sector. And that will bring us definitely on, on to the question on who is leading um, in One Health, because we know in Washington schools, there has been a lot of uh, movement in the last decade to enable the education sector to take a lead, not the engineers, not the health sector. Um, and that's maybe a question for all of us to reflect later on, um, who is leading One Health and how does leadership look like? Um, Dr. Uh, Wolfram uh, Morgan Klein, um, you mentioned or uh, you you have a, a big portfolio now as as a, a unit head um, and i know this is a new unit um this hasn't been in existence for very long would you perhaps explain a little bit why the german ministry is now putting this focus so much on one health and what is the some of the rationale and the expected benefits of doing so mm. yes okay well um First of all, I think it's uh, the, the thing we're doing here is, is really an approach and a way of doing things. And as I've said before, interlinking. Uh, so it's it's about mainstreaming the the health uh, issues into, into the sectors we are already uh, present in, in most of the cases, at least. Um, and this would entail to add One Health components uh, to some projects where they hadn't, haven't been before or where they haven't been as strong as before. Um, to give you just one example, uh, when we are um, uh, for example, uh, strengthening um, uh, natural uh, uh, protection, uh, we, we, we are working with the administrations of uh, protected areas and, and here we, we're dealing with rangers that, um, that are the persons that come into contact with, with wildlife uh, constantly. And, and here it is important to, to have a better education or of a better um, um, knowledge of these rangers uh, with regards to the possible uh, risks of, um, of of wildlife diseases and to to participate in a structure that um, is something like an early warning in in diseases that might emerge from wildlife uh, um, we have the same in the water sector uh, where uh, we uh, we know and and, and i think uh, science is developing quickly here uh, that the pathogen control in sewage water is, in, is a very important um, early indicator of, um, of risks um, for several of, of, of the waterborne diseases. And, uh, and the waterborne diseases are, well, are the main, one of the main um, uh, found of the main causes for, 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 um, um, for, for, um, uh, diseases and 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 as um, has pointed been pointed out, it is uh, often um, a more um, a quicker and more efficient way to to deal with health issues if you go to, through sectors like water, and not uh, uh, just um, build up hospitals where uh, those who who become ill um, get into. 
Um, well, and 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 lastly, in 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 the um, in the agriculture sector, we we, we have uh, of course uh, lots of um, projects where um, where animals play an important role, and and the and and the, the, the food they take, the 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 water they take, and the close contact to um, to humans. Uh, is something we have to be much more cautious about in order to to reduce. So we are trying to to put this into 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 the projects and and to enhance it. And uh, we have a yearly um, uh, target of uh, 160 million. We want to spend uh, in in those projects and 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 call them then one health projects. And and that's what we have achieved last year. What we are achieving. Um, this year, and we hope to to make this as a, as a constant um, uh, mainstreaming into it. But of course, we we are also dealing with international um, with international um, discussions about One Health, and and here um, um, I would feel one of the very important things is to improve on the on the early warning and surveillance systems that are in place, together with WHO and and together with OEI. The, for the International Organization for Animal Health, together with FAO and together with UNEP, to 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 look um, into a better system that integrates environment data, animal health data, and uh, human medicine data, and um, that is capable of um, well monitor what is happening. We have a pandemic, a running pandemic, so to say, and we have a lot, lots of needs to monitor it much better than we do now. But uh, an early warning system, which um, also would apply to 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 many other risks, um, to many other viruses, to many other bacteria, to to antimicrobial resistance, for example, which is one of the uh, one of the big risks uh, for future um, pandemics. And 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 here we we try to be one of the partners that uh, together with all others thinks of how to better build up that uh, future system and how to how to finance it also. Thank you. This is a, a very sizable investment and commitment from the side of the German government. Um, I think everyone here in this session will appreciate this. As a, as a very solid engagement. Um, also, this uh, aspect of early warning is definitely of interest now in the pandemic, as you, as you already highlighted. I think what came out also from what Bella said, One Health is a concept um, that is, has not so often been the starting point for activities. It is more that existing activities have been reframed under the One Health lens or have added an, a component, like you said, um, um, that would then relate to One Health. Um, maybe, Kate, um, when you think about, uh, you you were highlighting the anthropo anthropocentric approach, so the, the human entry point or the human focus on um, related to One Health. And I would think uh, from Bella's perspective and, and from Professor Belisario's perspective, of course, human health is at the, is one of the main drivers um, for One Health. In this context, Kate, how would you see um, the relevance of WASH and of the environment? Um, and are these areas that are maybe underrepresented or under-focused on when it comes to One Health? Yeah, um, no, certainly are. Just to, to quickly react to, to Wolfram's point, I mean, about uh, integrated surveillance, I mean, that is, I mentioned the expert group before, and that this integrated surveillance and early warning is, is absolutely, you know, one of the, the highest priorities. Um, and there's the specific expert working groups on, on that question exactly, it's super important. Um, but to, to your question about uh, where WASH fits in, I mean, I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm getting a, a bit old, but I feel like for the 10 years that I've been at, at WHO, we, we, you know, every, every week we're going into kind of health meetings going, oh, you need to work intersectorally, you need to think about prevention rather than cure. Um, and, and so, you know, that's really our day-to-day -day kind of business is trying to bring this intersectoral message to, to the health sector. Um, and I think, actually, I think, in recent years, especially, there's a there's that door is a lot more open to us, um, and you know, I think there's an increasing um, understanding that that you know a more complex world needs more complex uh, ways of and nuanced ways of looking at things, and the intersectoral 
coordination is key, looking at the many sort of bottlenecks within the health sector and looking at, I mean, sometimes it's called One Health, another major kind of um, pillar of this, which has the same uh, concepts as health and all policies, which is really looking at how you can leverage action and, and housing policy and urban planning and water and education sector policy in order to, to have outcomes um, for health. I think uh, where it's, um, it, it always kind of flounders a bit is around the getting to, to how do we actually make this collaboration and sexual coordination work? How are, how are uh, we incentivized or not incentivized to work together in the way that the funding streams and the coordination mechanisms work? So, so I think, I think what uh, I'm seeing now is a shift, just to, to really boil it down, a shift in the discussion from like, why should we work together to how should we work together? And I think that's, that's we've still got some way to go on that, but there's some quite good um, examples emerging. I'll stop there. That sounds like, like important progress and a moving away from just conceptual thinking um, to some practical, tangible, um, change and and as you said and maybe bella um and june might also uh, elaborate on that a bit it reads it also needs some some degree of capacity building and supportive policy frameworks um with with tangible um realistic arrangements between agencies as you all have highlighted so far june um professor belisario um I, the link between environment and um human health is very obvious and very strong in your areas of, of intestinal worms. Can you just talk a little bit about this and why WASH in this context is so particularly important in schools? Thank you, Habib. And of course, when you talk about schools and school children, you talk about the most common intestinal worms, the most common of the neglected tropical diseases worldwide, We're still afflicting many, many of our children, more than a billion children still afflicted with worms. With the pandemic, we, we take a, a couple of steps backward, now we're farther you know, to our targets. And among uh, the worms, you, know, you, you, you will need to consider WASH, you know, water sanitation, hygiene, environmental health, to actually avoid reinfections and to actually move things closer to targets. And the targets of the WHO include elimination of moderate to heavy intensities of, of infection. These actually talk about children with roughly 10 million eggs of Ascaris or giant round worms per day. And, and that's so, so much in terms of transmission to the environment and getting others infected, you know, even if they have taken the warming tablets you know, earlier. And so it is, it is a community effort. It is a school effort. It is an effort, not just of the health sector, but also the environmental health sector, water, sanitation, hygiene. We're getting more information now, Habib, that the more common worms are actually partly coming from animals. Now, hookworm, for instance, here in Southeast Asia, are known to cross over from dogs and cats over to humans. And there's more information now from our colleagues from, from the Mekong area, you know, Thailand. And therefore, we need to bring in animal health you know, to the fore. No, so that we will understand the phenomenon better. No, we, will, we will have more information. Part of surveillance is really generating data, data, and data. And where we base now are policies, hopefully enhanced, and improvement of our service delivery. So in other words, WASH, environmental health, animal health, are so, so integrated with neglected tropical disease control. In fact, WHO likes to use the term elimination. In the Philippines, I said, no, we're not ready for elimination because we're not too serious, we're not too serious yet with water sanitation, hygiene, and environmental health. Over, Habib. Thank you. Thank you, June. Um, yes, the, the idea of this worm infections, these worm infections are really seriously impacting on children. And, um, knowing that 800 million children worldwide in schools are lacking basic sanitation, water and hygiene um, in facilities, this is a major problem. Two in five schools are not reaching basic service levels. So we, we really have a challenge here in front of us. Um, coming to you, Bella. Um, as I said before, when the, I think when you started with the, the Fit for School program and you put the, the ideas together and you 
um, the, the program evolved, One Health was not um, your, your driving force behind the work. Um, but now, gradually, um, the program has morphed um, from a pure school health program into a washing schools program. And beyond that, can you please maybe elaborate a little bit on this journey that the, the program has taken and, and how it, you see now the One Health concept as a new opportunity for thanks, uh, washing schools. Yeah, thanks, Habib. Um, I think that all of the previous speakers that perfectly fits to the entire wash in schools approach. I think previously, school health programs were very much focused on individual diseases. And I can just say it from myself, I'm a dentist by profession, and I was out to improve and support the Ministry of Education in the Philippines to improve oral health of children, come up with strategies to improve oral health, a very even it affects, uh, even it affects, it's the main uh, child disease globally, affects most children. Uh, it is something which is not very high on the agenda. And it was uh, looking how to improve oral health via public health measures. And of course, that can only go hand in hand with improving hygiene in general. It is never possible to do just something on one, like, like improving oral health, impossible. It could only be together with also hand hygiene, improving hygiene and looking for manageable interventions in the school context. And of course that mean, meant also you need access to water and soap, far bigger than looking at oral health. And then looking also to get this into the management of the education sector. Even this is an objective of the health sector, but the health sector could never implement preventive measures that can only go with the education sector, for example, implementing healthy, <clears throat> healthy routines in school. So the big part would be also to really this, inter, this all these talks about intersectoral collaboration over years, everybody had it on, uh, on, on the, everybody was speaking about it, but it's very difficult to implement because each sector has their own objectives, has their own budget lines and all of this, which makes it very difficult to really um, practice intersectoral collaboration. And I think the school is a perfect place to really do that because it's very clear the school is the jurisdiction of the education sector, but it's also clear that the education sector has to implement health measures. And that cannot be done by the health sector coming into the education sector. It has to do by the health sector themselves, specifically really looking for a healthy school environment. And that also sounds so big, but it's very important to come up with small manageable steps, which really possible to implement on school level. And that means they have to be very simple. They have to be scalable. It doesn't mean anything if we have something done in 20 model schools. We need to implement that in thousands of schools, 10,000, 100,000 of schools. And only then we can reach scale. <clears throat> and only when we reach scale, it will have an impact. And then it will be sustainable because it can only be sustainable when it's done by the government. So. It, it is something which needs small steps, but clear steps. And these steps have to be backed up by the health sector, that these are exactly the right things to do because the education sector is not an expert in health. There, it needs the expertise of the health sector, but then the education sector has to implement. Yeah, just as an example. I stop here, thanks. Dr. Morgenroth Klein, you were raising your hand and you were nodding um, in agreement, I hope. Yes, of course, but I would also like to be critical, not with regards to what has been said, but with regard to uh, something we observe so often that uh, up to a certain point, the One Health concept is trendy and is sexy. So everybody mentions it, but in practice, we still often find um, nothing behind it. I will give you just uh, two examples. Um, we, we, have, uh, we had a, a, a very important uh, scientific institution in Germany presenting us a concept on how to better um, build, to build up um, expertise in, in, in One Health for postgraduate students and, 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 and scientists. Uh, and the, the word One Health was mentioned many, many times. Um, in the end, when we looked a bit closer to it, we found out it was all only or practically only about human medicine. 
and the question was where are your veterinary um, veterinaries here where are your uh, environmental scientists in, in in your concept so please um, uh, think about it and come back with a concept which really encloses one health and, and something th similar happens with the early warning system i've mentioned before in most cases i've i've looked into when i've looked into some of the ideas uh, the main street, the main thing was about uh, human uh, medicine data, um, and, 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 and it is right to have it very, very uh, strongly here. But um, if we if we uh, if we say one health is important for early warning systems, we have to find good solutions on how to integrate the animal health data and the um, environmental data, the climate changes that uh, are certainly influencing on on the future health situation of animals and and humans uh, likewise so so there is much work to be done here in order to to really put it into practice and to to force the different disciplines to work together and and it's it's hard and it will be small steps as bella monza has pointed out thank you yes uh, so moving from concept to practice and from and leaving the human-centered um, thinking um, for One Health, maybe is that related to, to leadership? Um, thinking back some 10, 15 years in the school health sector, also school health was kind of sitting between the chairs. Is it the health sector coming to the school and doing something, or is it the education sector driving something? Similar to washing schools, um, whose responsibility was it, or is it? Is it the public health? agencies is it an uh, infrastructure engineering um, unit is it the education sector and maybe we have here the similar situation in one health where the, the leadership and driving um, uh, stakeholder group is perhaps too health centric at the moment um, Kate, when you look at WHO in particular um, you you mentioned earlier on that yes one health has been quite a while already on the agenda within WHO um, and that there is now this move from, from concept to implementation. What, what does that practically mean? Um, what, what, I mean, WHO is a, uh, an authoritative agency that works with through guidelines, through um, policy templates, um, through technical assistance to, to member states. So what would you, where would you see um, One Health and Washington schools um, coming on the agenda. I mean, WHO has a big unit on for health promotion and health promoting schools, for example. Are there any practical links, relations that, that are in place or that could be tapped into? Yeah, I think, well, firstly, to just to say, I'm in the uh, water sanitation, hygiene and, and health team. I think there's, there's one health collaborations that are happening across WHO and, and I can't speak to all of them, but um, so I, but I, I'll talk about some of the, the ones that we work on and, you know, I, I think it's, it's good to sort of be challenging about the concept of One Health because I, I personally feel it's, it's also, you know, it is quite vague and it's very, it's very hard to disagree with One's Health as a concept, right, of course, why, that's, yes, that's, that's clear, but, um, but it's, it's, it's tricky to, to ground that in something that's practical and, and efficient and, um, and I, I I think we need to be really honest with ourselves about uh, and, and learning from experience about where this real added value of working together is, where exactly those intersections are, and um, where in some cases it might be more efficient to work, you know, somewhat in silos on, on aspects of, of the problem. And I, I think part of the reason some of these things uh, have floundered and is because people are not necessarily uh, honest, it's not really the right word, but, but we talk about intersectional coordination, but we don't um, really account for the, the cost of intersectional coordination, the, the time, the exhaustion of trying to understand the way another sector thinks, you know, that, that all has a cost. And I think that's sometimes why we go into One Health initiatives with good intentions and come away from it kind of a bit, a bit sort of tired and confused. Um, so I think there's things like uh, doing uh, WASH and, and One Health concepts within schools, within healthcare facility settings, it gives us a really nice opportunity to ground the One Health concept in a specific uh, intervention where we can kind of explore some of these things about the efficiencies of, of um, where it makes sense to work together, what the added value of each uh, 
sector is or, um, or, or specifically you know, sorting out some of these responsibilities that was, that was talked about by Bella and others. Um, so the, the places that we're, I, schools within our team is, is not really a setting we're working in at, at any sort of scale at the moment, but there's a lot we can learn from our Washington Healthcare Facilities Initiative. And there's a, um, I, I mentioned before, getting from like what to, to how, and there's some really strong tools emerging in there, um, these sort of eight practical steps that, that clarify what needs to happen at the kind of national and enabling environment level in order to, to bring those two sectors together. And then the other one is um, the NTD's, Washington NTD's strategy. And um, I think has, uh, was, was mentioned now, and I think this is absolutely critical in the Washington NTDs now, we actually have a national, a global target within the NTDs roadmap that specifically says this is how we need to target um, high or 100% wash coverage in endemic areas and in, in households and in schools. Um, and I think that sort of political leverage drives this, this intersectional coordination at, at the more practical level. And then at the programmatic level, we have this Washington Health Working Together Toolkit, which was designed for NTDs, but is actually, you know, cuts across intersectional co collaboration between WASH and, um, and the health sector. And, and that, you know, that includes just really practical things, as Bella mentioned, trying to understand what your, what your common objectives are with, with the, the, you know, where is, the, where is the intersection of the objectives between the two sectors? Um, things like mapping, trying to understand where are this, the sort of high endemicity of, of certain diseases relative to where is the low wash coverage. Um, and, you know, joint planning, joint funding, all of those sorts of things are just, uh, just a lot of very practical tools. Um, and you know, I think that's, that's certainly where we're at, at now. And I think it's really exciting to see those same contexts concepts being applied in a, in a school setting. I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned a, a lot of those practical, tangible ways to make intersectoral work happen. And, and also, you, you touched on this uh, washing and neglected tropical diseases strategy. Um, I see, I think June has a lot to say about, about this and, and also about the importance of uh, schools as for mass drug administration for intestinal worms. This is a, a, a major uh, place. June, any, any thoughts on what you heard so far? Uh, just to share a bit on the worms in the school children, the worms in the schools, and, and just the deworming that, that of course, uh, WHO is so emphatic about now the mass drug administration, so-called preventive chemotherapy, there's no longer any shortage of deworming tablets now. The, the problem is how to get the children to access the deworming tablets, especially now with the pandemic. In fact, um, um, one health approach in a pandemic situation is so, so relevant because as we approach and hopefully we're approaching the end of the pandemic, hopefully closer than ever. Um, we have to join forces, not the various disciplines, not to generate the, the data and the information, the evidence, and the various sectors working together not to enhance the service delivery that has lagged behind as a result of the pandemic. Add to it climate change. Now, Wolfram has talked about it earlier with the pandemic and the climate change. And there's evidence that shows that the warm infections have, have more chances to proliferate as a result of hastening the maturation of the infective stage in the environment and hastening the maturation of the worms. And so really it calls for uh, more than just diagnosis, more than just treatment. We need to enhance the wash. In fact, we had, we ha we had a, a, a byword, uh, Habib, no? We used to call our initiative, uh, the warming in the schools, it was a challenge before because nobody wanted to be dewormed. Teachers refused to be assisting the health workers to deworm because they said they were not doctors or nurses when these are over-the-counter preparations. So we succeeded. We called it war on worms. Then we realized you treat and treat and treat, you cannot achieve elimination. The target is less than 2% moderate to heavy intensity infection, according to WHO, all because water sanitation hygiene lags behind. So we called it wow, wow, wash, war on worms. 
and water sanitation hygiene. Then we realized, Kate, we measured the, uh, the stunting rates and all, oh my gosh, shocking stunting rates in the areas with the highest warm prevalence and intensities with the lowest coverage of sanitary toilets. No? And it was the other way around. In the areas that had better wash because there was zero open defecation as a result of, of Typhoon Haiyan here. So many groups wanted to help Eastern Visayas and they were able to demonstrate zero open defecation in certain communities. We went in and saw, my gosh, the warm infection rates and in intensities are so, so low nearing elimination. And the stunting rates were actually lowest in those areas. And so now we call, it's not only war on worms, it's not only wow, wow, wash, water, war on worms, water sanitation, hygiene, wow, N wash. What is the N? War on worms, nutrition, water sanitation, hygiene. So that is, that is I think, you know, it exemplifies. And I think we need to demonstrate one. We keep on talking about it. But we have to demonstrate and show the evidence that it can be achieved you know, with that kind of an approach. Over, Habib. So, so the package, the package becomes larger and larger, um, yes. which is in in flipping it around, of course, a challenge if you want to bring all of this to the school context. And schools already have a full portfolio of of objectives and, and activities. Nice yeah, the schools will be on a very nice platform for that. Yes, it is a great platform, definitely. Um, let me come um, with the last ten minutes again. Encourage our audience to to use the chat function and to to post questions. Um, let's focus a little bit on this element of of monitoring. Um, and I see Bella has raised her hand. I, I'll come to you, Bella, in a second. Um, there is this famous saying from uh, former WHO Director General Margaret Chen, what gets measured gets done. Um, so how do we measure One Health? Um, we know how to measure WASH in schools, and we know that um, very well, uh, actually. The Joint Monitoring Program has established indicators that relate to the SDGs, and WASH in schools is part of the SDGs. One Health as a concept is not in the SDGs. We have to, to put it together, piece it together from different areas. So um, Bella, um, Kate, and, and everyone, and, and uh, Dr. Morgenroth Klein, how do you see um, One Health measured, and how do you see this this focus of on schools maintained or emphasized more? Because schools are these tangible places where One Health can be put to life. Bella, would you like to go first? Yeah, I was first saying when you look back in the past, it was very much school health and. It was very much seen as something you teach there. It was always just seen as a point where you can expose ideas and you can you can educate children about, but and perhaps also the parents. But what is the the real big shift is now that schools themselves have to be healthy places and that they're clear concepts. For example, like I get back to this: what gets measured gets done. Uh, many parts of the world have now very clear. Uh, in, uh, indicators which what schools have to measure and uh, in, in many countries there are systems existing which are you which are drive by uh, incentive based monitoring system which means when schools reach a certain standard they reach certain threshold and this like an accreditation system they're able to reach certain star level for example so schools have very clear lists what they have to have and this very often involves the communities that they, the communities also want their children to go to a star school they don't want the children to go to a school which is not a star school and this is a driving factor even within the education sector to improve the wash in school status of the school. And that is not just access to water, that also includes concepts of environment, of, of waste management that's re really broad, that's access to water, that's really access to certain number of toilets, that's also access to and cleaning toilets, operation and maintenance, which is fully in the hands of the education sector. So parts and waste management. So it's a very clear concept what a school has to have. And I think this is being measured and more and more countries measuring that really in all schools annually figures are existing and you can see with this very clear concept how the school environment is improving with from some countries where figures over the last uh, four, four years we have really data on this we can really see how a clear concept drives and gives guidance for the education sector what exactly has the school to do and I think this is the big difference. But there's far more clarity, there is clear, this 
great uh, global direction with the SDGs has helped a lot to really see what is the direction so that schools are not left alone, what to improve or where to be. This is really a movement within the education sector, guiding school heads and community, what exactly they have to do to improve the situation and not having from a situation where nothing is there, uh, an, a standard which is somewhere in the sky, which nobody can reach, but really guided steps to how to reach certain uh, thresholds to improve the situation. So monitoring and data collection as an incentive to improve for so the data use on the one hand at the global level international aggregation, but also on the local level those where the data are actually generated. Um, yes. Down to school uh, level uh, as a guidance. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Margot Klein, and what are your thoughts on the, on this measuring aspect um, related to One Health and, and WASH? Yes, well, um, I'm not really an expert on it, but uh, I'm grateful, uh, therefore, that uh, the practical um, example of schools uh, really shows that uh, data are not just data, but they are being used and they can be very helpful. Um, Nonetheless, I think that on on the global on the global in the global arena arena, there has to be much work to be done in order to 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 standardize um, data in order to um, have a better data collection, um, and the better data collection will only happen in many countries if they are useful, if they are proven useful also for the country, um, um, and to and to process them in a way that makes sense. So the, so the big task of setting up a new WHO pandemic intelligence hub as it, as is planned in, in, in Berlin, I think will be, uh, um, will, will uh, in, have a lot of work to do um, with in, in that area. Standardizing better data collection, especially in countries where data are not good. Uh, even in the EU, the standardizing uh, um, and collecting data in, in human health is still a big, um, a big challenge. Uh, and 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 now, if we come with one health data, it will be an even big, bigger challenge um, in in the European Union. But uh, here we have mechanisms to to progress. Uh, so so we have to do lots lots of things and and also support partner countries to to have um, a more meaningful uh, practical data collection, um, which then is also a contribution to global health. Um, because if 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 we do only data collection between the rich countries which have good data, we will not achieve much for global health. I'm I'm completely sure of that. So so it's still a long way to go, and and but we we are willing to do it, and and we we know that there's a lot of interest in doing it. That's good to hear, um, and we, we, we don't have much time until 2030. Um, and as we see the data coming in, um, acceleration on all fronts is necessary. And I think that was also the idea of putting this session together to see really how whether One Health can help accelerating progress in Washington schools. Um, I'm uh, wary of the aware of the time. We have a few questions from, from the audience that more or less focus all together uh, around how to raise awareness for One Health um, and how to uh, make intersectoral collaboration um, a reality. So the question is where, what are some practical steps? You, Kate, outlined already a few. Um, Bella, you also mentioned some. At what level do you start? Do you start at the policy level? Do you start at the local level in a school um, with the school community? What are your thoughts on this? Open yeah, to I anyone who would like to. Yes, uh, I think I think very often great policies are in place. Very often, what you can see is policies are in place. Is always the big question how to implement the policies. And uh, what you would need is really breaking it down into what I said before, really doable steps. If you look, for example, just on the school level, what can really be implemented? Everybody speaks about a healthy environment. What does it mean? And what would be the respective doable steps and that means steps which are really as i said before simple and to be possible with the resources a country has and if you look at this they're not if you look just for scale what is really scalable there are not so many steps you could immediately do but with little steps which can be done and there is a lot which can be done 
getting schools and school communities on the journey to start to improve one place in their community, that's the school. And within, this is happening in many places. And with that, you as schools are all over really reaching out into each place within a country. It is very important to have this as a part which gets important with the, uh, within the education sector supported by the health and the environmental sector and the wash sector. But the wash sector can never do it, just as an example. It has to be on the goal of the education sector. And I think that's happening currently specifically with the pandemic. And I think that's something we should also see as a big driver to improve. And that will also then prevent, because that's a movement. And that movement is already strongly ongoing. It's not zero. There's a lot happening around the world in the area of washing schools. And that movement goes on and will also carry exactly the One Health concept to nearly, yeah, the education sector is the most, the sector which is infiltrating the country the most. So you get the ideas to all places where you have schools, if you're able to and really ingrain it in the education sector. And as schools are closed around the globe now, and we all know this, this big, big problem of school closures that needs improved wash conditions, improved one health concepts, implemented one health concepts in the school context. So I think. Um, hey, we see your passion, Bella, for this topic. Uh, we have sorry, two minutes yeah. left. We have two minutes left before we are kicked out of this session. Let me ask each and every one of you for just a, a very quick a one sentence final closing um, remark. What is your key message um, to the audience, to each other um, related to Washington schools and One Health? You would like to go first, Dr. Morgan Klein? Well, the key message for my side is that this is the place and the time to do much more about it um, because we have learned uh, in a difficult way, in a tragic way, that how important it is to prevent um, uh, diseases. And uh, if we do it, we will not just prevent one, but many others. Thank you. Kate or, or June? Kate? Yeah, I'm just quickly picking up on this point about, about monitoring. Um, really look and help e information systems, see whether there are really indicators there that capture these, these broader risk factors and what they're incentivizing. Picking up on the, the example of, of intestinal worms, a big change has been going from measuring coverage, how many, how many children receive pills to what is the rate? And that really built into that measurement is, is the One Health concept, like what are we doing to, to prevent rather than just uh, distribute? There's many examples like that, but look at the indicators and what they, what they incentivize. Thank you, Kate. June? Thank you, Habib. Washing schools and One Health, do it, show it, demonstrate it and use data to actually prove that it works. Let's use data, surveillance data, good monitoring data that stands peer review, no? that, that one health approach can accelerate washing schools. My last word is that uh, if we could tie up these initiatives with capacity development. I'm in academe and I'm very concerned about the future, the future leaders, the young ones we will train. We're working with each other across different sectors. So let's not forget capacity development, human resource, various sectors. Over, Habib. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect closing, um, summarizing up um, our hours discussion. Thank you for this exciting talk. Um, it was really great to bring these topics together. Um, I think we will have to continue this discussion from, from various angles at various levels in different fora, perhaps, um, and see how, how we can really bring One Health to life in the school context and enhance Washington schools, definitely. I thank the audience um, and for listening. I thank all the panelists for, for their time, for those based in Europe, for getting up so early. Um, I wish you a happy day. and. Please share the word and share the present, share the, the recording to your colleagues and friends in your networks that might be a first step to get moving. Thank you.